And I wanted to welcome everyone to this, um, which is our first community night for CVLA, our Centennial Virtual Learning Academy. I'm Kristen Herman, the online and digital learning coordinator at Centennial. And we also have Anthony Gabriel, our assistant superintendent of teaching and learning on. Um, we're gonna introduce ourselves a little bit more kind of as we go through the presentation. So we'll leave that kind of as all the introduction you're gonna get for right now. If you do have a question that's sparked, I've got about a 20 minute presentation for ourselves. Um, and I want to kind of go through that presentation for you guys and then take some questions. But if something sparks a question, you don't wanna forget about it, please do use, we have what's called a Q and A section. Um, and you can type a question in the Q and A that we will come back to, all of our panelists will be able to see it. And I was just informed that we have our other assistant superintendent, Dennis Best on as well, and our superintendent of Centennial, Dana, Dr. Data Bedden on as well. So kind of a great group of panelists here who should be able to answer any of those questions you may have. Um, if the Q&A is kind of beyond you, you're new to Zoom, that's not a feature you're used to using. If you just wanna wait till the end, I know you all are muted right now so that we can kind of go through the presentation, but if towards the end of the presentation, we will prompt for questions and you can just raise your hand um, to speak and we'll let you know that you're able to speak by unmuting you and then we can do questions like that then. I think that's all the business. We did introductions, we did recording, we did Q&A. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna to start tonight talking about our Centennial School District's virtual learning vision. Um, I used to be a teacher myself and so I am not a big reader off slides. I don't believe in the read off slides method, but this is so important that I do want to start by reading a little bit. So bear with me. At Centennial School District, we strive to, I have everyone's blocking my view here, we strive to understand and meet the unique needs of each of our learners. To that end, we provide multiple pathways, all designed to help our students be prepared for their increasingly digital futures. Regardless of learning path, we value each student as a vital member of our Centennial community. We've really worked as we've established our virtual learning path to work collaboratively. So there's four of us here on the call with you all tonight. Um, and I think that belies several meetings we've had with assistant principals, with counselors, with student services, with our tech team throughout just six weeks of the summer so far. So we really are taking a collaborative and reflexive approach to our virtual learning vision. You'll also notice I have some phrases in here bolded, multiple pathways, the kind of nebulous phrase of increasingly digital futures and a vital member of our centennial community. I'm gonna keep coming back to those phrases kind of over and over tonight and, and hopefully explain those because I know something like a digital future can seem a little bit of, what, what does that mean? Those are just words. Um, so hopefully by the end of the evening, you'll be able to understand what we're meaning by those increasingly digital futures. Speaking by the end of the evening, we do have some goals. We wouldn't be educators if we didn't set up our presentation with some learning objectives and goals here. So our first goal for the evening or learning objective is that you're able to walk away with the clear differentiation of the paths we have for Centennial students coming up in the upcoming scholastic year. We do have several virtual learning paths available and I wanna make sure you have a clear picture of what those options are for you and your learners before you leave tonight. Our next goal, and I kind of this kind of a trick goal, whatever a trick learning objective can be, will be to characterize a typical Centennial, that centennial Virtual Learning Academy learner. Um, and I'll explain why that's kind of a trick as we go through that word typical, kind of giving you a clue already. And then our third goal, we're here tonight to kind of critically reflect and dialogue. We will have time for questions. We do want your feedback. So there will be time for us to speak a little bit as well and for you to get any kind of questions that we didn't pre-anticipate answered. Let me start with just a little more background about this position and myself. So the online and digital learning coordinator position was created to support our Centennial teacher, staff and students. I'm really excited that this is the approach that Centennial is taking coming, I won't say coming off a pandemic, we're still going through a pandemic, but as we look forward kind of as where we want our next school year to go. I think we've seen school districts kind of go in two different ways. Some have said, you know, we're going back to normal. We can't do anything virtually. We wanna be everything face to face. And I think while that's a really positive message for about 85% of our learning population, we have populations who really thrived in the online environment. And so I'm just really proud of Centennial for rising to meet that challenge and say, we're not leaving any of our learners behind, that we're going to meet all of our learners exactly where they need to be met. 
Um, I think also we're seeing some school districts saying, okay, we do realize that that 15% of learners needs to be met, but we're not ready to do it. So there's nothing we can do yet. And I think Centennial is really taking an interim approach here. And we'll talk kind of more about that as we go through the presentation tonight. Some background into myself. I was a classroom teacher for 15 years. I taught English language arts grades nine through 12, everything from the lowest level ninth graders to AP seniors taking English literature. I taught for two years in Northeast Philadelphia and then for about 13 years down at a public high school in Delaware County. Um, our public high school in Delaware County, I don't know if they were prescient or what it was, if they saw the pandemic coming, but they started an e-school themselves actually pre-pandemic. And so I've taught across all three modalities. I taught English 12 in a face-to-face -face classroom at the same time that I was teaching a smaller cohort of students completely asynchronously online. And I was actually teaching another section of students in a blended format where they would come to English class face to face with me one day a week, and then they would be online two days a week. So I've taught across kind of all those modalities. That experience with blended learning really captured my heart into the world of blended and online learning. And I went to Westchester University as their learning technologist for three years. Um, I wanted to, you know, we were very nascent at our school in Delaware County, and I wanted to see kind of what was happening in more established realms of online learning like universities. Um, so I spent the pandemic with Westchester helping their 17,000 students be online and their um, large number of faculty work to uh, deliver their courses online. And that inspired me actually to um, go after my PhD. And so I'm working on my doctorate at a program in instructional design and technology through Old Dominion University in Virginia. My focus in that PhD, my focus in my research, my focus in my practice, and words you're gonna hear kind of come up again and again tonight, really centers around equitable access and opportunity. And I really see online learning as a chance for us to give equitable access to students who aren't always able to come to a face-to-face -face environment for myriad reasons. Um, I think we in the past have said, okay, well then that's not an opportunity these students are gonna have. And what I like to always kind of push back on is, well, no, how can we give this opportunity online? Because I definitely think there's ways for us to provide those opportunities in a digital format for all of our learners. So you'll hear that as kind of a reoccurring theme this, this evening. But let's get back to Centennial a little bit. So I wanna talk about what school's gonna look like at Centennial coming up in the fall here. We've got three pathways we wanna focus on tonight. Towards the um, far end side here, you'll see the traditional brick and mortar pathway. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on that tonight because I think that's pretty familiar to all of us. Brick and mortar, meaning our face-to-face -face classroom where a student comes in, they're with a the teacher, they're with a class of maybe 20 to 25 students um, sitting in desks or in small groups, doing small group activities, doing lectures, watching videos. What I'm gonna focus on is more my middle box and then my other box to the other far side are synchronous and asynchronous options. Now, synchronous and asynchronous are words that can apply to in-person learning. I'm an English teacher, so bear with me. Synchronous, syn meaning same, crone meaning time, so things happening at the same time. So anytime we have students all watching a brief YouTube video together and then writing in their journals all at the same time, those are synchronous learning activities that can happen in a face-to-face -face classroom. When you add the A to that, asynchronous, A is a, a Latin word part that means not, so not at the same time, students doing things at different times throughout the, the course of study. What I really want to focus on is how that synchronous pathway and that asynchronous pathway can play out in some digital learning opportunities. But what I also want to focus on is that regardless of which pathway seems right for your learner and your family, that all of our students are part of our Centennial School District. I was at a training for online learning just last week with some teachers from New Jersey, some teachers from the various counties in Pennsylvania, and someone came up to me, they said, Centennial. I know someone at that district. That's a district where the community really takes ownership of what's going on in their schools. And I was like, yes, what a great thing to be known for, to know that you want your students raised to be citizens of Centennial, to be citizens of our community. And I want that to be true regardless of how our students are approaching their education. When we talk about that academically and what that looks like, I just wanna give some comparison data here. So you see, I've gotten one of our cyber charters here and we picked Agora because we have some students in the Centennial um, School District who have elected to go to Agora in the past. Um, that's not the only cyber charter that we have students elected to go to, um, but it's one that I had data on from US News and World Report. So I'm gonna share some data that's specific to Agora compared to specific data from Centennial. But I don't want you to think that I'm cherry picking data and that I've chosen Agora for a special reason because it's a special cyber charter. 
The data I'm sharing from Agora is really common to a lot of the other third party cyber charters we have in Pennsylvania. So here's our Agora data. And again, this comes from US News and World Report. This is not a study that we did here, it's a national study. US News and World Report finds that Agora Cyber Charter ranks number 518 out of 678 schools in Pennsylvania. So that's pretty low. And again, that's not just Agora. All of kind of the third party cyber charters we're seeing are rating in the last 100 to 150 slots in kind of that rating scale. In our middle box, we've got some proficiency levels. The students at Agora are only, only 22% of the students who go to Agora are ending their time there with a proficiency level in math. Only 47% are proficient in reading. And then the one that really struck me, Agora only has a 49% graduation rate in four years. Um, so that's, that's, less, that's less than half. In addition to that, the cost to taxpayers, so our members of our community, we pay to educate all of our students, but to send students to a cyber charter like Agora, that's an additional $8,000 on top of what we pay to educate our students at Centennial. Um, so we're paying quite a bit and it doesn't seem like necessarily we're getting a lot for kind of that, that deal. I've got Centennial up there in red font and I'll give our stats here. Centennial's ranked 311 out of 678 and I, Definitely think, you know, that it's much better than we're doing here with Agora, but I also want to, you know, comment because we've got Anthony and we've got Dennis and we've got Dana on here. I think we're very proud of where Centennial is and where Centennial's going. So I only see that number kind of going up over our next couple of years together. When you look at our proficiency levels, 58% of our students are proficient in math, 66 are proficient in, re proficient in reading, and our graduation rate. We do really pride ourselves in making sure our students are ready and able to graduate 93% of our students graduate within four years going through Centennial. And that's at no additional cost to the taxpayers. So when you look at some of that comparison data, I think that's a pretty strong narrative right there. When we look co-curricularly, so I focused on academics in that last slide, but when you come to the Centennial Virtual Learning Academy, as opposed to one of our other third-party charters, we also focus on the co-curricular experience of the student. So that means everything that makes up a school experience outside of academics. Students who go through CVLA are still able to take our electives. They're still able for our MBIT program, which is our technical college program. Um, so I don't wanna quite use the term dual enrollment, but we could have a student and we do have students who may be taking some virtual asynchronous classes and then also going to the technical college or students who are taking three of their classes virtually, but then coming to William Tennant every day for band or for orchestra. And so some of those kind of, maybe we'll use the word hybrid scheduling options are possible if that's a question that, that you're sitting on. Students who are in CVLA are also eligible to be, to try out for our sports teams, to be a part of our club. So they can still take part in any of those electives. Again, that graduation rate, a diploma from William Tennant. So it's coming from the Centennial School District as opposed to kind of a, a third party cyber charter with that low ranking. And as we look at our future plans, all of our CVLA students are paired with their Centennial Guidance Counselors and our student service support staff. So we're really taking a community approach, just like Centennial is known for, to our virtual learning. Let's drill down into those virtual learning options just a little bit deeper. So I'm going to start with our synchronous. Remember, it has kind of more options for students to meet at the same time. And I've got a couple slides here for you on our synchronous option. Our synchronous options are gonna be small cohort-based classes, and they're only cohorts of other Centennial students. So when a student might go to a third-party cyber charter and they're kind of, they might be with a third grader from Centennial, and they might be with a third grader from California, or they might be paced in their own course shell, so they really have no cohort. All third graders who enroll in Centennial Synchronous Virtual Learning are placed in a small group together. And so they'll be meeting with that small group and their virtual teacher with just other Centennial students. So again, really that strong community mindset. Daily scheduled sessions occur in our synchronous um, online learning with certified online teachers. And those are gonna mirror the traditional school day in terms of the way we meet. Now the times might not always quite match up to our centennial schedule, um, but that idea of meeting for a reading class and meeting for a science class or meeting four periods of day at the high school level is very parallel to what we're doing in our virtual learning experience. 
And this is going to allow our students to really make a virtual classroom community. So this idea that if all of our third graders are together, the teacher is able to say, hey, McDonald's doing their Halloween parade next week. Who wants to go to the Halloween parade? And we can get the parents on board. We can have all the students say, yes, we're gonna do the Halloween parade next week. So even though we're virtual learnings, we're coming to the school next Wednesday for the Halloween parade. We're meeting up with our guidance counselors for some chaperoning. And then our students still get to take part of those kind of community activities. I'm sharing some sample schedules next and I've broken some of these up here. Now, again, don't quote me on the times. These are not supposed to be, your student will absolutely be in math class at 9 a.m. if they choose this opportunity. Um, we're still building out schedules. We're still building out times of day. So these are definitely sample schedules. Here's a sample elementary schedule on our synchronous learning module, on our synchronous learning model. I wanna point out that although we have several time slots that students are required to log in, they don't necessarily stay online all day. So if you're looking for a program where a student is on from nine to four all day, that's an option here, but it's not the only option. So the way the synchronous learning schedule is built out for our younger learners is that they'll probably have between 20 and 30 minutes of dedicated synchronous time for each subject. So after our homeroom period where they do some announcements, at 9 a.m., the students may go through a full group cohort lesson of math. And then at around 9.30, the teacher will wrap up that lesson. If the student feels like they need more support, they'll stay on Zoom with the teacher and then they can kind of have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation. But students who either feel like they've got the concept and they're, they feel good or they're ready for a break, those students can pop off for a while and kind of have a half hour break before they're coming in for the next synchronous check-in. I wanna point that out because even if your student is one who may need support in math, but also needs the time to pop off, you can see that twice during the day at 1030 and at 245, there's one-on-one -on -one support as needed. So if your student is one who can't sit still for a super long amount of time, they're gonna pop off at 930 to kind of move their bodies. They haven't missed the opportunity to talk about math with their teacher. They can circle back around at 1030. They can circle back around at 245. So there's opportunities for our students to kind of get that synchronous support they need from their virtual teachers in this model. I'm sure this is a slide that might spark some questions. I don't want you to worry that once this slide is gone, it's gone for good. If questions come up about this schedule, I'm very happy to navigate back. In the interest of time, I'm gonna push forward now and show a sample middle school, high school schedule. So this is built more off the idea that we've kind of got those four periods a day, four classes that we're taking at once. The periods are longer, but the idea stays the same where there's a mini lesson for just a portion of that period. Then the students are dismissed to work asynchronously. Again, your student may decide to stay on and get some one-on-one -on -one support, your student may decide to log off and kind of take that time to work through that subject material, to work through subject material that's coming up in the next class. So there's some flexibility kind of with each of these periods where students are not necessarily having to stay on from eight until about 1.15 every day. I'm gonna differentiate this from our asynchronous virtual learning model. And I want to be careful here because I do think that the asynchronous can be a bit of a misnomer sometimes. The asynchronous virtual learning model is definitely a more flexible model. If the last two slides gave you a little bit of anxiety because there was so many times that your students is going to need to log on Zoom and how are you going to have alarms going off at the house multiple times a day to make sure that they're logging on to Zoom when they need to log on. If that seems stressful, the asynchronous model might be a better fit for your learner because it allows for that flexibility of the student being able to choose their place of learning, their pace of learning, and their time of learning. That doesn't mean that the students aren't supported. So there's on-demand virtual teacher support, and that comes in kind of different ways. Teachers will have office hours as well as optional synchronous sessions. Teachers let students know about that via an announcements feature as well as what, via V. <laughs> as well as via weekly emails so that students would know, oh, there's an there's a optional synchronous science session in biology coming up this week. I wanna make sure that I put that on my calendar. I wanna attend that. Or, oh my gosh, that biology session, that's when I have to be at work in the afternoon. I wanna email my teacher and set up an office hour one-on-one -on -one support because I need to go through the, oh, it wasn't a biology, I need to go through the Krebs cycle or whatever the biology concept is kind of for that lesson. 
So an asynchronous model doesn't mean our students aren't supported. It definitely does mean that students are going to build more self-advocacy and self-regulation skills. And there are some kind of automated tools built into the asynchronous virtual learning model that allow for that, such as pacing calendars, such as goal setting software, such as weekly progress reports. But of course, automated tools are only as good as the people using them. So if our students aren't using the pacing calendar, that's not a great model. And that might be where we go back to, okay, is it better to have that synchronous support multiple times a day? In due diligence, I wanted to give a sample schedule here to kind of create a balance. Notice this is a sample K through 12 schedule. I've just kind of combined these. And again, we're not looking at one day with times here, but we're looking at a week's worth of instruction. Um, now, again, these days might not match up. You don't have to start work on a Monday because the work is in the course from the moment the students en enrolled. But I set this up for ourselves kind of on a week that started on a Monday and ended on a Sunday in my mind. On Monday, the student would begin their asynchronous work. There's an optional synchronous session on Monday afternoon. Maybe the student makes the plan to attend it. Maybe they feel strong in English. So that's not something that needs to be added to their calendar. Tuesday afternoon rolls around. The student realizes, oh my gosh, it's always oh, poor science. It's science that I don't understand. It's that Krebs cycle again. Um, I need to get some help on this. Not a problem. They send a quick email to their virtual teacher. They include the hours that they're available so we can find some common time for the student and the teacher to meet up. One of those times that they're not available is Wednesday morning, because if it's a younger student, they're going to that Halloween parade, so they still have that opportunity to be part of our community. Older students, sorry, you don't get to go to the Halloween parade, but you're taking the PSAT that, that Wednesday morning, which is so exciting because you can get a National Merit Scholarship, so that's an opportunity you definitely want to take advantage of. Um, so that would be a time when you wouldn't be able to meet because you've already got something planned for that block of time. But Thursday in the afternoon, you find some common time with that teacher, you're able to meet up for your science lesson, and you still have then several days to kind of finish up that module of work and submit your final assignments for the week. I do think that kind of moving through asynchronous virtual learning with weekly goals in mind is the best way to do it, and the research will back me up on that. Um, students who say, you know, I'm just going to let it, let it, let it spread out kind of over the course of the semester. It doesn't tend to work as well for them. So that weekly schedule does seem to be a very strong model for our asynchronous learners. Logistics that are going to be common, whether you're doing an asynchronous or a synchronous virtual learning schedule, there is mandatory attendance required, and that's going to be captured in a couple of different ways. Online learning obviously looks different than face-to-face -face learning. Attendance is gonna be captured both by students logging into the platform. So we will be tracking how often students log into the platform and by submitting assignments. So it's not enough to just be attending synchronous sessions if you're not gonna submit any work. It's not enough to be just logging into the asynchronous platform and reading the materials if you're not gonna be submitting any work. Both of those components are gonna factor into attendance. Weekly progress reports are gonna be sent out and those will cover things like pace through course, grade to date, last login date. So you'll be very familiar with what we're looking at in terms of attendance when it comes to pacing, when it comes to login dates, um, because you'll have access to that same information. Not only will you have access, but we're gonna have multiple observer roles. Observer roles are able to get weekly progress reports and able to log in to help monitor a student. They can't change curriculum or anything like that. But we're offering observer roles to any student service staff. So if your student has an IEP, they will be partnered with student service staff who will have an observer role. And a guidance counselor within your home building will have an observer role. So that you have kind of, again, a community approach in addition to myself and the parent as observers really all working together to support that student and making sure that, that we don't kind of have anything fall through the cracks. Whew, I've been talking a long time. We're gonna to get to some questions here. And I do have some that have actually been sourced as I've been preparing this dialogue from some of our parents who've expressed interest already. So let me just go over three big questions I have and, and then we'll open it up a little bit. The first question I've gotten is, this is so great, but why can't I have a centennial teacher? Our Centennial teachers are phenomenal and I'm not trying to disparage the job they did last year at all. They really rose to a very difficult occasion. We are trying to support those teachers this year by providing them training and credentialing in online design and delivery. Currently, none of our Centennial teachers have that certification in online course design and delivery. So we are partnering with outside virtual teachers who are certified in those components. And that's kind of 
again, we go back to that interim step. The, the opportunity there was, sorry, the option there was either to provide nothing this year because our teachers aren't certified, to spend the year getting our teachers certified and then not offer any virtual learning until next year or the year after. We didn't wanna do that. We wanna support the students who want virtual learning in the interim. And so that's why there's a gap here of why you're not having a centennial teacher. In terms of transition, can I come into virtual learning at any time? Can I leave at any time? We understand that the COVID situation is evolving still daily. Because it's a safety concern, you can transfer into virtual learning at any time. The transfer back to brick and mortar. So if virtual learning isn't a strong fit, you think you wanna come back to the brick and mortar environment, that's gonna happen at the trimester and semester. And again, we've got that group of individuals who's gonna support your learner through the semester to get them to that point. But that again, allows us to prepare for things like social distancing and rearranging classrooms to accommodate more students, to rearrange schedules to accommodate more students in the building. So those transitions back to brick and mortar have to happen at specific times. High flex, there's been a lot of terminology that's been thrown around the last year. So I'll define how I see high flex. High flex was the model where we had some students attend class on Zoom while other students were in person and the teacher was in person kind of managing students in front of them and students on Zoom at the same time. That was a great kind of emergency situation, emergency remote modalities. But all of the research on high flex has been done with post-secondary learners, people who are over 24 years old is the entire body of research on high flex learning. As a matter of fact, the research that's coming out about the past year shows us that the longer high flex goes on, the more learning and equities are raised because a teacher is just unable to kind of focus equally on Zoom learners and in-person learners at the same time. So we're not really interested in kind of promoting those learning and equities. That's not a modality that we're going to be offering this year. Those were three big ones. Now, I know I haven't told you how to kind of sign up for us yet, so I do have that coming. I have just two slides after this, but I want to open up while we're talking right now. So again, if you have any questions, I'm opening my question field. Um, if you want to raise your hand for a question, if I see a hand go up, I can unmute you and allow you to talk and ask a question of all of us. But I'll pause for a moment here. And then we can always do questions at the end as well. All right, let me go through my next two slides. And if that does spark something, or if you're looking for the kind of the Q&A um, on, on the bottom of your Zoom bar so that you can ask a question or looking for your name so that you can hit that hand icon to raise a hand and speak, um, you'll have time to kind of do that over the next two slides as well. I just wanna finish up here again, kind of going back to that first question there about our centennial teachers. I love this as our interim solution for this year. I'm really excited about it, but I want you to know that we are preparing for our future here at Centennial and our increasingly digital future to kind of come back to that phrase. Our goal over the next three to five years is to have increased Centennial ownership of our virtual learning academy with our own Centennial teachers. So we are training our teachers this year. We have cohorts going through and we have cohorts planned for the next two years as well. Regardless of modality, we're gonna see increased digital opportunities. The pandemic really taught us that our higher, ed our higher ed institutions are turning increasingly digital. So we wanna make sure our students are ready to do discussion boards online, are ready to submit assignments online, even if they're taking a face-to-face -face class. We also wanna make sure our students are ready for the workforce. We're seeing more opportunities for flexible work from home, for flexible work from home opportunities. We wanna make sure our students feel confident and ready in job interviews to take part in those. So regardless of modality, you're gonna see increased digital opportunities for all your students. And this allows us to increasingly personalize schedules, kind of like I was talking about where a student may come in for band and then take some virtual classes um, through our CVLA program as well. So we are asking you to communicate your enrollment ideas by the end of the month, by July 30th, which is the last Friday in July. I know this is a tough decision, it's a big decision, and I know it's hard as the COVID situation evolves as well. We're asking for this because we do have to build schedules in our virtual learning platforms. And it's not quite as simple as building the schedules that we have existing in our brick and mortar. So we do need to have those kind of enrollment numbers, names, and schedules figured out by the end of the month. 
two ways you can do that. You've got my email at the bottom here. And then I also want to recommend that you go to the Centennial School District website. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to stop sharing and make sure that you can see everything in my screen. So bear with me just a second. I'm going to go ahead and share again, and I'm going to share everything. When you click on my link here, you'll be taken to our Centennial School District website. If you look under our departments to our technology and online learning page, our online and digital learning portal looks right here. And again, anything that you need clarification on, you can find with either our asynchronous or our synchronous program. There's also a way to register here under each one of these. When you click in there, there's an application process. And by clicking through there, there's a form right there that you can use to apply. So you can either make use of this or my email address, which if I go back to that front page is on that front page of the online and digital learning. Scroll back here. Oh, I went back too far, sorry. Feel free to email me right there as well or to, or to call to make a note of that email address or that phone number. And I'd be happy to help you kind of get registered in the program that's right for your learner. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording for now, but I am going to.